Thank you, Ralph Barat. Good afternoon, everybody. So this is uh, grades nine through 11, right? Great. Last time I was on this stage, I was playing in the band with Schlock Rock about uh, five months ago. You were? Okay, so if you liked it, I was the guitar player. If you didn't like it, I wasn't. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so this is a great school. I, uh, I haven't spoken here in a while, and uh, it's, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. This program is being dedicated to the memory of Mr. Henry Mitrani, whose granddaughter, Shana, is right here. And uh, he was a great man. I was only privileged to know him um, just for a couple of years, uh, maybe a year and a half or so towards the end of his life. But uh, I found him to be an incredible man, very inspiring, and I will always carry with me the lessons that he taught me in just the few times that I, I got to meet him. He's a great man, and I'm happy to dedicate this program. The family is dedicating the program to his memory. Okay, here's how this works. I teach by becoming different people. And I'm going to become two characters today. And the way I transition between characters is I take this thing. What's this called? A movie clapper. A clapboard. <laughs> now, I did, I did a program in England with this. And I had a whole argument with people because they insisted that in England they call it a clapperboard. So I Googled it when I left and they were right. Um, we call it a clapboard or a director's slate. When I slap it, you see I, I, on Pesach I did programs like this at a hotel. I slapped it just a little bit too hard and a piece flew off on Yanta if that wasn't fun. So now I'm much more gentle with the way I slap the clapboard. I'm going to become two characters. Something about the character. The main character that I'm going to be is somebody who is based on research that I have done for a several year period, along with two interviews that I personally conducted with paratroopers who fought for Yerushalayim in 1967. So it is based on first-hand sources, eyewitness accounts, and in some cases, personal interviews that I conducted. If anybody wants to know more specifics about the events that I will describe, you can reach me through Rav Parat or Rabbi Levitt. They have my email. I'll be happy to share with you more sources. Okay, let's jump in. My name is Gadi Alon. And I was born in the old city of Jerusalem in 1944. We lived in the Iratika, and I'd like to describe it to you a little bit. We had everything, but we had nothing. We were rich, but we were very, very poor. Let me explain it. In terms of material things, owning things, clothing, food, we were very, very poor. I had two outfits, one for the week, one for Shabbat and Yom Tov. But I didn't know I was missing anything. Food, we ate a great deal of bread and potatoes, a little piece of chicken, Shabbat, Yom Tov. So on regular standards, Western standards, we were very poor, but we were also extremely rich. How were we rich? I need everybody's attention, please. We were very rich because Jewish life in the Ira Antika was very intense. We had about 2,000 people living in a quarter of a square mile. Only 2,000 people. But we had 56 Batek Knesset and Yeshivot. 56 places 
to pray to God, to study His Torah. There were great men and great women who lived on every street. Why, across the street from me lived a great man named Rabbi Yechiel Michal Tukachinsky. He was considered one of the greatest rabbis of his day. And I will let him describe an incident in his life in his own words. My name is Rabbi Tukachinsky. I was born in Lechovich in Ukraine in the year 1872, and I died in Jerusalem in 1955. When I was 28 years old, I had the big zuchus to move to Eretz Yisrael. It was a dream of mine. And I settled in the old city, in the year Atika. I was a very simple man. I wrote many books, books about Jewish law, Books about the laws of Avelut, warning. Books about the holiness of Jerusalem, And I was consulted as if I were a judge, but I refused to take any money for the school that I helped run, for any of the judge duties that I carried out. I refused to take money for that. My only parnosa was from my sparring. I'd like to describe an event that actually happened in my dining room, if you could call it that. It was a very simple room. I didn't have very fancy furniture. In fact, I didn't even have a finished ceiling. We were sitting around, when I say we, I mean great rabbis from Yerushalayim who came to consult with me on a difficult case of halacha. We were sitting around the table. On the table were books, Jewish books, documents, I sat at the head of the table, and there were many rabbis around the table who were much more wealthy than I. And suddenly, in the middle of the conversation, a little piece of dirt became dislodged from the dirt ceiling and fell right on the table, on the document in front of me. So I was used to that. That happens all the time in my house. And I just moved that little clump of dirt off to the side and continued my conversation. One of the other rabbis says, Rabbi Tukhichinsky, forgive me for interrupting you, but I must protest. And I said, whatever for? He said, how can a rabbi of your stature live like this with dirt falling off the ceiling? Why don't you take some money from the school that you work with? You could afford a better house. I smiled at him. I picked up the dirt in my hand. And I said, Rabbi Goldstein, do you see this little piece of dirt? This is the dirt of Yerushalayim. It's not the dirt of Paris or of Tokyo or of New York. Because this is the dirt of Yerushalayim, who knows who ever stepped on this piece of dirt? Maybe Abraham Avinu stepped on this piece of dirt. Maybe Yitzchak or Yaakov. Maybe David Amelech. Maybe Yirmiya, the prophet. Kings and prophets might have stepped on this piece of dirt. It is an honor when a piece of dirt like this, so suffused with holiness, falls on my table. And I gave it a little piece of dirt like this. And I put it back in the sink. This is Gadi again. So you can see the type of people who lived in the old city. 
It was a city that was imbued with Kedusha, with holiness. And life was rich and wonderful. The greatest possessions that my parents owned were my father's tefillin and talit and my mother's Shabbat candlesticks. But life was about to change on May 14th, 1948. Of course, you know what happened on that day. Declaration of Independence of Israel and the war. Both answers are correct because the war broke out. Where five Arab armies conspired to wipe us off the map. The fighting in the old city was particularly fierce. Of the 2,000 people, 700 cleared out right away in the beginning of the fighting. There were 1,300 other people. Of that amount, 200 were fighters. Some of them with skinny, bony arms with tattoos who had only recently come over after the Holocaust. Some of the fighters were women. But the 200 fighters were no match for the 1,000 expertly trained Jordanian legionnaires, trained by the British, and well armed and equipped. And in two weeks, only two weeks, to the day, just like the Declaration of Israel, independence was on an Erev Shabbat, May 14th, so too did the old city fall just two weeks later, May 28th, Erev Shabbat. And it was just about an hour or two before Shabbat that we were exiled from our homes in the old city. We were marched out, people crying for loved ones. 69 people were killed in that battle in just two weeks. 300 people, prisoners of war, transferred to Jordan. And we were escorted out. Luckily, there were international observers protecting us against the massacre. And so closed the chapter of uninterrupted settlement in the old city of Yerushalayim. What did we do? We recovered. We lived on as Jews tend to do. And I was raised by an aunt and uncle in Bayat Fagan. Has anybody here ever been to Bayit Fagan, Yerushalayim? So we were raised in Bayit Fagan. I grew up, went to Yeshivot, and joined the army. I joined the army to become a Tzanchan. Anybody know what a Tzanchan is? A paratrooper. What do paratroopers jump out of? Blades. And I was trained to jump out of aircraft. We knew that war was about to break out with Egypt and Syria. And I was trained to fight on the Egyptian front, behind enemy lines. One of the powerful things about paratroopers is, if you have a front and you're here, and the enemy is here, by use of parachuting soldiers, you can suddenly have a presence of several hundred well-trained men behind enemy lines if you just fly over there and drop them. And my mission was anti-tank because the president of Egypt, does anybody know his name at that time? Nasser. Excellent. President Gamal Nasser made no secret of his intention to crush the state of Israel like a bug. He had 1,500 brand new Soviet tanks. But there was one problem. Between Egypt and Israel was the Sinai Peninsula that Israel captured in 1956 and gave back as part of a settlement in which the United Nations occupied the Sinai Peninsula in a demilitarized zone. So in May of 1967, when we are ready for battle, 
Nasser tells the United Nations, leave the Sinai now. And they did. No protests, no international fiasco. They picked up and left. Suddenly, Israel is vulnerable to 1,500 tanks, the latest model. We were training in the Negev, and we had our radios tuned to Radio Cairo, so we could hear very clearly, day in, day out, Nasser's voice. I don't know Arabic very well, but I'll teach you three words that we heard all the time. Itbah al-Yahud. Anybody know what that means? Slaughter the Jews from the word tevach. It's related to Ivrit. Itbah. Itbah al-Yahud. He would scream it. 100,000 people in a rally in Cairo. And they would start screaming it again and again. Itbah al-Yahud. Itbah al-Yahud. This is a cry that is still uttered today in Arabic. By people like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But here was a president of a nation promising very specifically to enter Palestine and rid the world of all the Jews in Palestine till their blood would flow into the Mediterranean. Act of war number one, telling the United Nations to leave, forcing them to leave. That is, in international law, an act of war. People always say Israel started the war on June 5th. Not so. Egypt started it on May 22nd. The second act of war, anybody? Somebody say something? Yes. Suez Canal. Excellent. The Suez Canal and the Straits of Tehran. The entrance to the Red Sea, which was so vital for Israel's economy, was closed off to Israeli shipping. That is an act of war. If Russia would try to do that to the United States and block off shipping lanes, that would be a declaration of war and the U.S. would respond. We were ready to be dropped behind the massive armor that we expected when the war began. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. And then on June 5th, we're listening to our daily Itbah al Yahud, and suddenly, wave after wave of Israeli aircraft are flying overhead. Sound. Where are they going? They're going towards Egypt? Has the war begun? And as you all know, Israel launched a preemptive strike. The war had really, technically, by international law, already begun. But now Israel was prosecuting the war on the offensive because we couldn't wait for them to arrive. The air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan were destroyed in the first hours of the war most of them on the ground, some of them in the air in dogfights. That eliminated a tremendous threat. So now what was the Air Force to do? Destroy the tanks. They started doing our jobs. And we were very excited about it, but then we realized they don't need us. When are we going to get the order? When are our planes going to go into action? And we kept asking, our commander, Colonel Matagur, Mordechai Gur. We're ready to fight. When are we going to fight? What's taking so long for the order? He says, I have to get the order from headquarters. When is the order coming? It's coming, it's coming. Relax. But the order never came because the Air Force was so effective in the South. And as happy as we were about that, we felt like we were wasting all of our valuable training. We wanted to protect our homeland, and we had no way to do so. 
Finally, we got a crazy order that was so outlandish that everybody was upset. Chevra, get on the bus. We're going to Jerusalem? Are you kidding me? Jerusalem? I'm trained to jump out of planes in the desert. Why are you sending me to Jerusalem? We were told there might be some action. Jordan may attack. And if they attack, there's some shooting already. If they attack, we want you there as backup. And I remember we were so upset, we actually kicked our parachutes before loading them into the trucks. And then we ourselves got onto the buses, which were not air conditioned, I might add, and made our tortu tortuous way to Jerusalem. And we got there just in time. Because 26 residents of Yerushalayim were killed by the time we got there. They were opening fire from the Jordanian side of the city to the new part of the city, because the old city, you recall, was already in Jordanian hands. They needed us, and suddenly they needed us desperately. Efo Amapot, we asked, where are the maps? We can't fight if we don't have a map. And the answer we got from Tzahal in Yerushalayim was, Eilon Amapot. We don't have maps, because we weren't expecting war. The war in Jordan was completely unexpected. But they were attacking. So we jumped into action. How many of you have been to Israel? How many of you have ever been to Giv'at HaTachmoshet and Munition Hill in Jerusalem? Have you been in the bunkers in that area? It was one of the most dense and dangerous bunkers in the entire Middle East. Built in conjunction with the British, it was a masterpiece if you're a Jordanian, but it was a slaughterhouse if you were an Israeli or a Jew. Just when we thought we were eliminating fire in one bunker, our men would get shot and killed from another one that we didn't even see. It was vicious, hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And many people lost their lives. But we took Givat HaTach At great cost, we conquered it. And then we moved on to other areas surrounding the old city of Yerushalayim. And the next morning, there we were, about 9.30 in the morning, a beautiful day in June of 1967, and we overlooked the Ir Hatika, the old city of Jerusalem. And I'd like to share with you what happened in those next hours. I was, of course, a religious soldier, a religious soldier. There were many religious soldiers, but most of the soldiers were not religious, including Colonel Matagur himself. But even he felt something special. He overlooked the Mount of Olives, all the desecrated tombstones that the Jordanians and Palestinians had violated after they expelled us in May of 1948, 19 years earlier. We saw the state they were in. Our heart ached. But Mata said, Hevra, we aspired to this very place for thousands of years. And I just received the order to liberate the old city of Yerushalayim. And we cheered, knowing that death was right in front of us. We still cheered, a chance to liberate the holiest place on earth. The battle began at 9.30. The Jordanians and Palestinians in the old city saw us very clearly and started firing upon us. There was a loud bang as we made our way up to one of the six gates of the old city, Shah Arayot, the Lion's Gate. A loud bang as a tank was used to blow open the gate 
The order was received from Moshe Dayan himself, the defense minister. No aircraft and no tanks in the old city. Who knows why? The second part of what you said is exactly what he said, which is, we are entering a holy city central to three faiths. If we use aircraft or we use armor, we might destroy other shrines that are not our own religion. This was the sensitivity and care that Israel took. Contrast that with the 56 shuls in Yeshivot that I told you about in the old city that were all destroyed within three days after May 28, 1948. But this is the consideration we have for other people. We storm through the gate. I'm following Mutta in a half track, which is it's like a truck, but the back is tank tracks. And we're going through the old city. And people are shooting at us, firing at us. Can I have everybody's attention to this? This is a very sensitive time in our history, and I'd like you to give it the attention that I think it deserves. Thank you. We're storming through the city. People are firing at us. Mate is calm. He's issuing commands to three different battalions under his command. I am following his half-track. I'm responding to fire. People are falling from rooftops, from second-story terraces. Snipers everywhere. People are dying on their side and our side. And finally, we make our way to the plaza of the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Dome, the Mosque of Omar, the third holiest shrine in Islam. Firing from the mosque. They are firing at us from the mosque. Their holy site is now used as a sniper nest. We return fire. Men fall from the windows of the mosque. We go into the mosque. We eliminate enemy fire. A truck comes out from behind the mosque. Jordanians firing at us, lobbing grenades. Men are falling around me. And suddenly, I just have this crazy moment as I'm returning fire. It's as if my mind has taken a stroll back thousands of years and I'm asking myself, why am I willing to die for this strip of land? Why are all of us here being shot at? Some of us dying, many, many wounded. And why? Let them have it. Let them keep it! And then, in this microsecond, this nanosecond of time, I start going back to lessons that I've heard. First grade, second grade, my parents at the Shabbat table. And all these things are pouring back into my mind. My father told me when I was a child, that the Kabbalistic sources in the Zohar say that the world, the universe, was started from a speck of matter that became the Kodesh HaKodashim, the holiest place in the temple. That speck expanded out into the entire universe. A few yards away, where the Mizbeach would be built, the altar, was another patch of dirt that God used to fashion Adam HaRishon. All of you and me come from that earth, if you think about it. We all come from Adam HaRishon. So does the rest of humanity. I'm fighting for that spot. Adam HaRishon is exiled from Magan Eden and he brings a korban, a sacrifice of atonement on the very spot from which he was formed. To teach us forever that when we repent, we're actually returning to our source and correcting ourselves. 
His sons Cain and Hevel bring Korbanot on that very spot. That's why I'm fighting for it. Avraham Avinu goes to the Hara Moriah, that very spot. Akedat Yitzchak takes place on that very spot. I'm fighting for that too. Yaakov Avinu has his dream where he sees what? The ladder. The ladder is, he's sleeping on that spot and he sees the ladder over that spot. Fast forward to when we enter Eretz Yisrael. Shmuel Navi and David HaMelech are searching for that spot. They know it's there someplace. And finally they discover that very spot. Purchase it. From Aravna. And that becomes the place for the Beit HaMikdash. Shavuot is almost here, my friends. Three times a year, including Shavuot, our entire family would go to that very place. Aliyah Lerege. We would go to the Beit HaMikdash. Both of them were there. And we would derive tremendous inspiration from that very spot. We would see the Sanhedrin with its 71 members deciding once and for all any disputes, any questions about Jewish law. There were no different minhagim. You went to the Sanhedrin, you got the final answer. Imagine the opportunity to see some of these great sages discuss the Torah. Ki mitziyon te Torah. Torah emanates from this very place. That's why I'm fighting and ready to give my life. Because our whole essence is from there. Our whole religion, our bodies, are really from that very spot. Now we snap back into reality and return fire. We clear the Temple Mount and you hear the famous words of Matagur. The Temple Mount is in our hands. That doesn't mean the fighting was over. Far from it. There was still plenty of fighting in different pockets, in other areas of the old city. But we definitely had neutralized the threats in the Harabayat. And now everybody said, Efo Hakotel. A lot of people ask me over the years, why did you say Efo Hakotel? You're standing on the holiest place in the world. The Kotel is just a retaining wall for the central parts of the Beit HaMikdash, the Mizbeach, the Kodesh, the Hechal. Why did you even want to look for the Kotel? This is the answer. I did my duty on the Harabayit. There were people trying to kill us. We killed them first. But I was very, very uncomfortable on the Harabayit. Anybody know why? so intensely holy. Unless you're a soldier fighting for your life, you're not allowed to be there without the pro proper purification. Para, Duma, etc. We were very uncomfortable. We were there only as long as we could. In fact, there was a ceremony the next day to celebrate its recapture. I couldn't go. I couldn't get myself to go. I hid behind bushes because I did not want to be in that part of the Harabayat. We were all much more drawn to the Kotel because there it was safe to go. Efar Kotel, we couldn't find it. What I'm about to tell you, my friends, is something that is so crazy and fantastic that even people who were there were afraid to put it in a book. But I'm going to tell you what truly happened, and you could decide whether you want to accept it or not. But I was there. We couldn't figure out how to get to the Kotel. We knew it was down some steps, but we didn't know where the steps were. We couldn't find the alleyways. And we're looking around in a very closed space. And suddenly we see a man. I am telling you, he wasn't there a minute ago. We see a man with a white beard, a white turban and white flowing robes. 
Everybody instantly picked up their gun, ready to kill him. But he just smiled at us. He didn't say a word. He just motioned with us to come with him. Everybody's gun is on him. And suddenly he points someplace. And I'm telling you, a minute ago I, I could swear I looked there and there was just a wall. Now, I saw a descending staircase. And then he just points. And we look back and he's gone. I'm telling you, there are at least a hundred eyewitnesses to this event. He's gone. He points it. I volunteered to go down first. I go down the steps. Everybody's covering me. And there's nobody there except the Kotel itself. I say herself because when I looked at the Kotel, she reminded me of an old grandmother whose children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren haven't been there in years. And she looked so sad and gray. And it just, it just took my breath away. It took my breath away. There I was. You know how many men fought and died for this moment? 800 people would die in the Six Day War. 180 would die to capture Yerushalayim. And of the 180, 98 were paratroopers. Which is why the special paratrooper ceremonies are always held at the Kota. As a way of Israel thanking San Khamen. I'm standing there, I'm looking at the Kota, and I have an instinct to, to reach out and, and touch the Kota. But there's something too powerful, I just can't do it. So I stand back, and I yell down to everybody, it's safe. You can come down to the Kota. And people start pouring down to the Kota. And they start dancing the Hora. And they start singing Yerushalayim Shul Zahab. And a third group starts saying Kaddish for all the people who were killed. Sobbing, screaming, crying, laughing, singing. All at the same time. Finally, I approach the Kotel, I move my gun to my back, and I put my hands on the stones. And it was like, it was like electric. I felt electricity that I can't explain pouring through me. And I, I was just crushed. I had to lie down like a baby, gripping the Kotel, and I started to cry and cry my, my eyes out for 10, 15, 20 minutes. My commander ran down the stairs. Are you hurt? He said, I'm not just crying. I'm crying. I'm not somebody who cries a lot. But suddenly I'm making up for lost time. And I'm asking myself, while I'm crying, I'm saying to myself, why? Where am I getting all these tears from? And I realize, you know, it's not just my tears. It's my mother's tears when we were exiled from the Iraqi in 1948. It's my great-grandmother's tears in Poland, in Russia, in Yemen. The tears of millions of Jews over thousands of years crying for this very spot. And I feel like they're all being channeled out through my eyes. That's the only explanation that I have. And finally, I pick myself up, wipe my tears, answered amen to one of the many Kaddishes that were said as people kept arriving. 
I sang Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, I danced the Hora, I did all those things, that entire range of emotion. That was me, and that was everybody there that day. To me, Yom Yerushalayim will always be a day of great joy and a day of great sadness and introspection. Great joy because Hashem did miracles, miracles that allowed us to recapture this territory and these holy places. And for that, we must be grateful, all of us who've ever been to Israel or davened towards Israel, must be eternally grateful for the kindness that Hashem did to us on Yom Yerushalayim. But it's also a day that we in Israel go to cemeteries <coughs> and honor the fallen, the many fallen, the many people who gave their lives for Yerushalayim and places all over Israel. I take great comfort, and so should you, in something you say every day in Shimon Esrei and Birkat Amazon. We say, God is Bone Yerushalayim. It doesn't say, Yivne Yerushalayim. He will build Jerusalem. It says, He is building it. And one of the great rabbis, Rabbi Shmuel Horowitz, in the 1700s said, for every mitzvah, every good deed that you do, every time you think about how much you miss the Beit HaMikdash and a rebuilt Jerusalem, God hears that, sees that mitzvah, and he adds another brick, and he is actually building Yerushalayim as we pray and as we do deeds of kindness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is Shlomo. I have one more minute. I will take questions if anybody... Is this working? Um, I'll take any questions if anybody has questions about the specifics, uh, who I heard what from, whatever you like. We have a minute. Okay, I'll ask the first question. Do you have a question? Go ahead. The question is, the Jordanians were trained by the British. How did that happen? So the British were under a mandate of the League of Nations. And the, it was the British who were running Palestine, administering Palestine on behalf of the League of Nations. The British had a strong affinity to the Arabs. And they actually had their best soldiers training the Arab Legion. And the Jordanians were the best fighters in the Arab Legion. In fact, this is one of the very sad things that a lot of people don't know. When the shuls were blown up, and I have pictures at home of the shuls in mid-explosion in the old city, a lot of the explosives were placed by British soldiers who decided to become mercenaries and become soldiers for hire. The Jordanians paid them money, and they're the ones who actually set the dynamite to blow up some of the most, most beautiful shuls in the Middle East. One more question, I think we're done. Any of the ladies? No ladies? Okay. Another guy? Yeah, in the back. What were your emotions when you, when you looked back and you didn't see the man standing there? Okay, so the man standing there, if you recall, I wasn't there personally, I'm not 71 years old. Right? I did this program at a hotel, people came late. And they're like, you're 71 years old? I'm like, yeah, I exercise a lot, eat a lot of matzo. Uh, it was on Pesach. So um, again, I became a character that is a composite of people that I interviewed and people that I read about with their eyewitness testimony. The thing about the crying, the tears being of the grandparents, that's actually somebody who was there actually said that. But here's the thing, and I'll end with this. The thing about the man in white, this is crazy. I saw it in a, in a book. And I said, there's no way I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to leave it out. Nobody's going to believe it. Come on, guy in a white, give me a break. So I left it out. I did this exact program for adults in Irvine, California, on the West Coast. 
Does anybody remember the name of the commander of the whole operation? Matagur. He's the guy who said Harabai Piyadi. His son, I did this program two years ago in Irvine. His son was living in California. I, I don't know if he's back in Israel yet. His name is O. Reed. He's about 47. He was born after the war. He came with his wife and his two teenage kids to hear the program. And obviously I was very nervous because here's Matakur's son listening to me. I did the whole program just like you heard it, but I left out the story about the man and wife because I said, come on, it's ridiculous. He comes up to me with his wife and he said, the program was excellent, but you left out the story about the guy in white with the beard. I said, get out of here. Did that really happen? I said, it wasn't in your father's own book. He said, he didn't put it in the book, but he told me about it. He said he saw the man with his own eyes. Thank you very much.